Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, I'm David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company, and this is the Stein Seedcast, a bi-weekly show where Stein growers, agronomists, and other special guests exchange product knowledge and agronomic expertise and discuss everything that goes into maximizing yield. So today we're visiting with Myron Stein, president of Stein Seed Company. Uh, one of the things Myron loves to do is get out in the country and talk with growers who are using our products. Um, and he's uh, here to talk to us today about a visit he's had with a corn grower. Uh, tell us who you're going to be talking about today. David, yeah, today we're we're speaking with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms, and they're in Northwest Ohio, and they use 105 day to 115 day Stein hybrids on their farm, and they're a very good example of of a farm that uses super management for their corn. So, uh, okay, so you, you, I've heard that term now. Tell me, what do you when you talk about super management? What are you talking about? Well, so if you look at a number of the genetics that Stein has in his portfolio, some of them are a shorter statured, higher population hybrid. And those type of genetics um, can take your farm to a new yield level. But to do so, you really have to use these super management techniques of multiple applications of nitrogen, assuring that you have sulfur with every application of nitrogen, for example. Really really paying attention to your finished population, maybe even focused in on your singulation of your planter, making sure your planter is dropping the seed evenly, uh, a number of those things. Okay, so yeah, so I've heard we've talked about, um, again, paying attention to all those details and having all the pieces of puzzle, and that's what it takes with high-density corn, and when you wrap all that up, you're describing that as, as super management. It's It's taking all those pieces and putting them together for maximum yield. Exactly. You don't, you know, with that corn, you don't uh, just drive by in your pickup and look at your cornfield. In some cases, some of these growers that we've talked to, they, they will walk their field almost every day and literally go through the field. So it's, it's all about the details and understanding how to get consistency out of those, of each plant that's out in that field. Huh. Well, I'll be anxious to uh, hear more about this with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms, and uh, let's uh, listen to the interview. Hello. So we are here today with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms in Northwest Ohio. They use 105 to 115-day Stein hybrids, and hopefully we learn some things about how they're managing those hybrids and, and, and extrapolate some secrets out of Mitchell today. So Mitchell, first, tell us some about your farm, your family farm, when to get started, just some details like that. It's a very interesting story. Yeah, my family had moved down here or moved over here from Germany in the late 1800s. Uh, they settled in Henry County, Ohio, and then uh, my uncle had moved down here in 1974. And we were actually the, he's actually the first person to ever farm the marsh out here. Yeah. He was able to clean it up and then um, was able to put tile in it and then started growing some onions and uh, potatoes. And then now we grow uh, processing carrots for Campbell's soup. So, so out here. Yeah. So you do carrots, soybeans, yeah. corn. Yep. We do corn, corn silage, uh, processing carrots and soybeans. Okay. So. Now on this farm, yeah, you know, I've seen, I see like a shop and mm -hmm. you know, you do a lot of your own work with equipment. Yeah. And you see some progressive growers doing that. Some growers don't do that, but I see you do a lot of that. Can mm -hmm. you can you talk some on why you do that and 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 how that's evolved over time? Yeah, uh, I think more than anything, just um, cost effective. It's just it's we've always been the type of people to we needed a new carrot harvester one time. We had just built our own carrot harvester. Mm -hmm. We got measurements from Asa Lift, and we were able to make kind of our own and. Um, We've got to keep guys. We need so many guys in the fall as truck drivers, so we can offer them a full-time job by servicing all of our equipment. We do everything on our planters, everything on combines, everything that tractors. Um, so we normally we stay almost too busy sometimes, and so so it's about economics. It's yep. about economics yep. in today's world. 
you need to do that. Yes. To, to be Everything is a lot more expensive than it was a year or two years ago. So. Okay. Now, Mitchell, let's get into let's get into your Stein hybrids, and mm. let's we're going to try to get some secrets out of you on what you're doing because you get some amazing performance out of your products and you get some amazing yields out here. So mm. let's first hone in on what are your two favorite hybrids. At this point? Uh, 9709 and probably 9734. The the two our two favorites right now because of the, the versatility of 9734. And then um, the more 9709 and the more long range of it, we can mm-hmm. kind of, we can plant that, you know, early on in the season or later, and it'll still dry down enough for harvest. And that's one if you really feed it well enough that it really has top end yield on it. So let's talk some specifics now. You know, you, you're in 20 inch rows, mm-hmm. 20 inch rows. As far as a yield goal, do you, you know, before planting, you know, as you're as you're planting the season out, do you have a yield goal like by field or by farm? Or uh, yeah, we're pretty spread out. We're 30 miles in all directions, so not really quite a farm goal itself, um, but more of a, a field goal and how we can kind of, you know, mitigate that uh, mitigate the risk and what varieties we know have performed before or will perform good on that type of soil as well. So seed bed preparation. Mm-hmm. Now there's something you do here that's unique relative to, to a number of growers out there. Let's talk about seed bed preparation. Yeah. So we are, we're trying to move over to hundred percent strip till. Mm-hmm. Uh, we strip till now our corn acres. We're, we're probably 80% spring strip till. And then the rest we do in the fall. Um, so we're putting, we try and put everything that plant needs in a strip in the spring. And then we try and why we like Stein is we can run a really high population on that and really feed that corn exactly what it needs. And then um, sometimes we'll come back and we'll wide drop and side dress if needed. Um, but some, depending on the weather and things like that, a lot of times you could almost put all your fertilizer up front in the spring and that'll get you through the year. And, and on strip tillage, you know, where you are, I'm assuming you're trying to heat that strip up too. I mean, there's yeah. there's some benefits Open to that. Open it up, yep. Do you have certain ground here where that's that's a necessity? Or does that not really matter going from your tougher ground to your... I wouldn't say it really ground? matters. I think the biggest issue we've had is some of the clay hills we have here are so tight that a 570 horse tractor won't pull it going up the hill. Really? Yeah, in the spring. So you got to do some of the fall. We've been trying to incorporate more cover crops as well in the fall and then come strip through the uh, cover crop in the spring. And it seems to, you know, soil breaks up a little bit better, not so compacted, not so tight in the spring. Let's talk about planting date. Mm -hmm. So planting date in general in this geography, it it will help the viewers understand, you know, what you have to do here in, in Northwest Ohio. Yeah, so we normally try and start April 25th to April 28th planting corn. Um, last few years hasn't really worked out like that, but we've always tried to go April 25th, April 28th to May 15th. Um, last few years, it's it's been so wet, we haven't started until middle of May. We try and hope we can get done before Memorial Day. Um, but I've planted corn full-time for, I think, five years now after I took over from my dad and I've never not planted in June. So, and actually in 2019, we started in June. So, <laughs> nitrogen application. So, mm-hmm. I know you put, you'd like to put everything on with your strip tillage. Mm-hmm. Is that really, is that reality? I mean, do you think you can always get that done? On certain farms, I think so. I mean, everyone has a good farm, everyone has a bad farm. I think on mm-hmm. those poor farms, I think you could feed it enough because your top, say your top end is only 190 bushel. Mm-hmm. You know, no, I think that's pretty easy to do. Where you get some of these other farms that you really want to push it and you want to see 280 corn, you know, then I think, yeah, I think you almost have to put enough down in the spring strip and then uh, starter with the planter. Then you come back and side dress at that V5, V6 if you have a wide drop bar and then another late season application, if you really want to get top end yield out of it. Sulfur. Do you put in sulfur with yep. your nitrogen applications? Yep. Every nitrogen application gets sulfur, whether it's in the strip. Um, we've done it on the planter, uh, wide dropping, everything. So, so every single time, which, yep. yeah, that's, yeah, we've, we have found that, that that's a practice that's essential on, yes, it is. on, on what we consider super, super management mm-hmm. of, of these hybrids. Yep. Now let's talk about population. Mm-hmm. 
9704, 9709, uh, they're going to probably be different on your farm in general than 9714. So mm -hmm. let's let's start with 9734 and 9709. What type of populations, what type of finished populations do you want um, when you get done? Uh, for 9734, it depends what kind of dirt I'm putting it on, but I hope to, I try and stay right around that 40,000. Mm -hmm. um, 9709, I will push a little bit more, um, depending on the fertilizer program we have in place for that that field itself. Um, we'll push that to 4244. Okay. Um, normally, and I'll I'll normally do the same with ninety seven fourteen. I'll I'll try and push that to forty four. Um, the only, yeah, the only issue with that is um, we have seasons like we've had early. I I like to grow some one hundred and two day for silage, and one hundred and two to one hundred and six day last couple of years, it's just been so dry. Is the only problem here is right. normally last few years, we first started growing sign ninety seven fourteen was one of the best varieties we had, but now, for some reason, we've changed of weather weather patterns. We've just been getting so dry in the summer, and it just takes that top end right off right away. Yeah, and it's it's definitely 105 days. So yeah, so it's your it's your on the early side, and where 9808 is on yep. your late side. Yep. You, you do both those hybrids, but you don't want a large percentage of your acres yep. in something like that. On fungicide and insecticide, mm -hmm. anything is it the same program across your farm. Is it is it do you, do you change that up? Uh, we change it up. Um, we've done a lot of testing with putting a fungicide down, a cheaper fungicide like a strobin for northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot on a V5, V6. And being in 20 inch rows out here, get hot and humid, you have no airflow in between those rows. So we'll try and spray a fungicide on early um, to kind of help it out. And then um, we'll normally do one right ahead of tossel or at brown self, depending on the disease pressure we see coming through. Sometimes if it is a really good farm and to try and keep that plant alive, we'll do one ahead of ahead of tossel and at brown silk. Okay. So. Okay, great. Well, Mitchell, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us mm -hmm. and talk about how you manage your your super management of corn on your farm. That's it's, mm -hmm. it's exciting to see that. I wish you the best on future years with, with high yields, and I think you're going to hit those regardless. I'm looking at your corn around here. You're saying it's dry, but uh, I, I've seen some amazing mm -hmm. stuff with what little rain you've, yeah. you've received. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so that's Mitchell Roars of Northwest Ohio. Great interview. I, you, you know, another really high caliber grower. Um, and, and now I see what you're talking about. You're talking about super management. I mean, this is somebody that certainly is on top of their corn crop, probably from before planting till it's in the bin. And, and, and it's pretty impressive to hear all the steps he has to go through in his process. You know, Roar's Farms, they, they do the strip till thing. Yeah. And I thought that was very interesting to talk about that. The idea in strip till is to put everything up front you know, 100% of everything. And generally with these higher management genetics, we don't think you can do that. And he did come out and say that they try to do that because they can put a lot down uh, up front. However, at the end of the day on their highly productive ground, they do have to come back with nitrogen and have, have sulfur with that nitrogen. I mean, you notice the sulfur thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. And that's something I know you know, we've talked a lot about is the importance of, of sulfur in the management program. And maybe to recap, do you talk a little bit about, can you recap a little bit of that, of the importance of sulfur in a, in a high management program? Well, yeah, with, without the sulfur, in many cases, the plant will not uptake the nitrogen. And some people put it on in the fall, but we've seen people that actually put it on with every application of nitrogen excel. In a lot of cases, we're seeing that, that that's a deficiency. And I've seen growers that have, you know, enough nitrogen on for a 300 bushel per acre yield goal, but they don't have enough sulfur. And so then at the end of the year, they don't hit their yield goal. They check their ground and they still have nitrogen in it. So it wasn't utilized by that corn plant. So the sulfur helps with the, helps make the nitrogen able to be taken up by the plant, basically. That's right. It's it's needed. And um, back when you had more pollution in the air, it, it wasn't as ne you know necessary. But today, we have cleaner air. We have cleaner air, and there's less sulfur 
available in the air for that plant to utilize. So you're saying there was a, a good thing back when all the coal-fired plants and and acid rain maybe wasn't all all that bad? Yeah, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, the good old days, good old days with, you know, smoke and, you know, kind of added and helped us grow crops. Yeah, but but to your point, the, there's the pollution is, you know, is cleaned up a lot and now sulfur isn't as freely available as it was in the atmosphere. And so, yeah, and that's something that seems like, that's something I hear a lot from, again, the growers that we talk to who are really successful in our, our program. Uh, sulfur is the common thread, the understanding of sulfur application in conjunction with nitrogen. Yeah. Another thing is the droughty uh, conditions that Roars Farms has had the last few years, and it shows you they're still using higher populations. So there's so many people that think, well, you know, I, I hate to push my populations because of what if I go into a drought? Well, the reality is these new genetics, that's not a factor. In fact, these new genetics, even if you're on poor producing piece of ground, those higher populations are needed for those genetics to work right and bring yield and performance to you on that ground. They've had, <laughs> they've had droughty conditions the last three years, I believe, and uh, he keeps his populations up, and that's paid dividends for them. And, and why do you think, what, what's with that kind of misconception that, you know, droughty conditions and high population corn don't, don't mix? Well, I think even us, before we fully understood what our program was bringing with these corn genetics, before we understood those genetics, we thought the same way. Well, we found out that what we're really doing in our program is we're selecting genetics that tolerate stress well. That's really what these shorter statured plants are doing. They're, they're, they're shorter plants. There's less biomass. They handle stress well or better because they don't need as much moisture, for one. And so I think that's always been in, in, in a, an old farmer's mind of, of how corn works. Well, with these new genetics, that's not how that works. You need to keep those populations up to make sure you utilize what you can get out of that ground. For those tuned in, we've been listening to Myron Stein and, and his conversation with Mitchell Roars of Roars Farms uh, over in Ohio. Appreciate you uh, bringing the story to us, Myron. Well, thank you, David. So we'll be back again in two weeks with a new episode of the Stein Seacast. If you want to make sure to never miss an episode, be sure and subscribe to the Stein Seacast wherever podcasts are found. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Stein has yield. <laughs>